Amen. You may be seated, Brother Steve. <laughs> Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Glory to the name of the Lord God. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. The Lord reigneth. Amen. And we're being shaken, aren't we? Don't let the shaking make you decide that he's not Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Feels rather strange to me this morning to have come to this point. A point in time and space I never planned to come to. This morning, this people in this pulpit. Never planned to come here. And I don't know what will happen this morning for... Last night, uh, Brother Joe asked me to speak, and so I was turning my mind onto the Lord and to his mind, his kingdom. And I went through my uh, pantry, and it was bare. My psychic uh, mind decided there was nothing there nothing to say. And the Lord reminded me that he will not give grace until the time it's needed. Amen. He does not give you grace until the time your foot stands on that ground. I saw that. And so I knew that he wasn't going to reveal anything. But I labor. Uh, anytime I'm called upon to speak, I go into a labor, a travail. Uh, almost a perpetual thing. Any day I'm to preach, I can't really do anything else. I can take a light workout. If I work out too much, it spoils it. Uh, if I read too much, it spoils it. If I dig out too many scriptures, it spoils it. Or if I would uh, get under, uh, become tense, and try too hard to get something, that spoils it. Being required to rest in him and just give it all over to him. I came down this morning, or I got up this morning, and God was working in me. And I perceive that it's too late now in the year to come to you with a formal sermon or a highly structured teaching. It's too late now, isn't it? Whatever we are to profit by in this year, if we didn't profit, it's too late now. Amen. Too late to conceive a word, travail, and, br and, br and bring something to birth. Too late now. For there's a time element written right into the law of every seed. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. And then the Lord reminded me what he's been teaching me for a number of years. That there are many roads into the pulpit. The pulpit to me is a lot like a hub of a circle or the center of a circle, there are many lines that converge on it from all angles. And one possible line is a formal sermon. And in the hands of a master, it's great, like Dr. Hero of Zion. A great construction, like Elijah's woodpile with the fire falling on it. Hallelujah. Dr. Hero used to sit down at the organ and play a formal introduction to his sermon. Valid in God, it's one way. It only works for Leonard Hero. It doesn't work for anybody else. There's just one of him. Hallelujah. And of course there was little brother Branham who had a gift. And if his gift didn't work, couldn't do a thing. One of Wade's classmates heard Walter Butler say, I'd go a long way to see a manifestation of God like that back in the days when it was good. You know, everything turned sour from that era. 
All that manna spoiled with worms in it. It all turned sour, but it was good one time. And John Bunny went down. And there was this poor little hillbilly about this tall, weighing about 130 pounds, murdering not the king's English, but Midwestern English. <laughs> and the anointing wasn't on him yet, and he couldn't do anything, and so he was stalling. So he stammered out a few scriptures. He said, well, he took that picture where Jesus saw Nathaniel under the fig tree on the other side of the mountain, and he was brought up by, was it Andrew? Philip, one of them brought him, and he came, and Brandon said, Jesus looked at him and says, I seen you, Nate, when you was under the fig tree 15 miles away. And John Bunny said, and they talked about the great Branham. And when you say great man, you picture somebody tall like Saul with a gorgeous head of hair. Like some people we've seen, not like me. I'm not very simple. I don't see a head of hair in here that really strikes me. Not one, but I've seen some. I've seen heads of hair that I'll never forget through eternity. They were so beautiful. One was Jakob Kachermalnik, the first violinist of the Philadelphia Symphony. I saw him one night, and it looked like black marble or onyx sculpted. Never saw anything like that before or since. Well, here was the great Branham, and he was little, puny, sickly looking from over-ministering, from being burnt out. Nervous, so nervous after he came out of his dimension of God that he couldn't endure to be around a brash spirit or an ordinary person. And Brother uh, Sather used to drive him around the New York City streets to let him unwind. Brother Sather could be soft and gentle. See, there are a lot of, there's a big price to be paid about getting into spirit. It's not the like you think it is. It's not like being, you know, Elizabeth Taylor in the kingdom. <laughs> it's not like that at all. And John Bunny's heart sings, is this the great Branham? And all of a sudden, a, 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 a qualitative change took place. And when the real anointing comes, you can see it. All of a sudden, just a slight outward show that something had come, and there was a healing line. A whole bunch of people needed to be healed. I don't know if they're in a line yet, or just formed in a line or what, but all of a sudden, Branham looked over and there was a black sister there that was at the Met in Philadelphia. And he looked over and says, I don't know you. He says, your sister Hubble, Mary Hubble. He says, you have cancer of the breast. He says, come this way. And he said, pass right on by. He said, Jesus already healed you. And he was in that depth and then that gift that, but it was a simple thing God gave him, but he had sharpened it. It was focused to a burning point of perfection. And God spoke to me this morning that the kingdom is a place of perfect gifts. Hallelujah. A perfect ministry. That's to those other ones over there. To get out the way. Hallelujah. something crying out for rebuke and it got it hallelujah that was a holy ghost rebuke glory to god the devil can't build a brass heaven over my head for god has given me a holy ghost blowtorch and even as an acetylene torch burns through solid steel, so does the Holy Ghost blow torch burn through anything Satan can construct. God put me on the grinding stone of life, the 
what do we used to call them? The grindstone we called it on the farm. A wheel, a sandstone wheel, and a pedal on it, or a treadle. <coughs> God put me on that for years to sharpen a few simple things that he gave me. And one of my great challenges is that the big religious devil keeps telling me, you've got to become a brilliant, dazzling, methodological teacher and impress people with the flesh. That thing hounds me down the years and down the days. But I can't become what he hasn't made me. Amen. If I have his blueprint and try to build according to the world structure, it's going to be just a botch. It makes me a little bit sad to see the many highways to the pulpit being unused and untried these days. Seeing a given people in a given local fellowship always doing the same thing. They're like a, a record that's played itself out and it goes around endlessly in that last groove until total destruction. I can't stand it. But I have been born for life, for vitality, for variety, for the whole kingdom. Hallelujah. Jesus said, Jesus said, I can of mine own self do nothing. And since Jesus came and went, we've had a whole bunch of Christians who are a whole lot better than Jesus. For they've been able to do something of themselves, many things. Build gigantic structures on the earth that men mistake for the kingdom of God. I want to tell you, if that thing isn't blessed, blessed, utterly blessed, it's not the kingdom. That's why Follett wouldn't belong to anything. Follett said, I go someplace and they have a blessing. Yes, I know lots of Pentecostals have a blessing. Churches of friends pastor, house meetings. And Follett says they have a drag with it. And he says, I can't go with that. So he had nothing to do with it. Praise God. I was born to be a free spirit. Hallelujah. We've been driving lately and seeing many great black buzzards and hawks of different types soaring and doing many things, and their wings are stationary. Yes. They may be doing a little bit of this, but the whole power is in the wind, not in the bird. Hallelujah. Yes, that breast meat is the flying muscle, the pectoral muscle. And we have men on earth that can bench press 650 pounds with their chest muscles, but they can't fly. And if there was no wind and no movement in the wind, the bird, the hawk, the eagle, could never attain his 10,000 foot elevation. But the power is in the wind, hallelujah. They sang 25 years ago or 20 years ago the revolutionary song, the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind, and the message of God came to me. And very, in a very profound and total sense, for me, the answer is blowing in the wind. I find no solace in this structure or the way we have our chairs set down, but I find it in that presence that comes in from the outside, from an alien world, and invades us almost halfway against our wills and comes and blesses us and gives us life. Hallelujah. Yes. Glory to the name of Jesus, who has conquered everything. For that reason, I can stand here behind this pulpit this morning in the confidence of Christ, not in my flesh. For I've explored the abilities of the flesh, and I've sort of seen the end of it. You know, as you go up through the, the layers of humanity, when you get within sight of Plato, you see the, the, you see the end, and there's no life in it. There's no life in it. The philosophers of Greece attained and attained and attained and climbed and climbed and climbed. They came to Jesus. He said, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. How many are glad that Jesus fell into the ground and the God life in him exploded? Hallelujah. God life explodes underground. Hallelujah. Not on the platform where you can strut. You can't build ministries by building the human arrogance. I asked Erskine about a certain young healer about my age. He's tall and beautiful like King Saul with a heavy head of black hair. I said, what was he like when he started? Erskine said he was arrogant. 
That's why he's a reprobate today. Glory to the name of Jesus. I can of mine own self do nothing. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So I've come into the pulpit on several different roads. I had to make a decision this morning not to come with highly structured thought, but to take what we could call a Holy Ghost approach. That's not very well defined, but a Holy Ghost approach. Coming into the pulpit knowing nothing, expecting nothing, having no preordained idea of how the service ought to go, but becoming an open door for God to get loose. That's what old Mrs. Woodworth Edder was. Hallelujah. <laughs> Brother Paul comes from the place where she shook, shook the land at one time. In fact, the earth shook as she ministered. She was a Holy Ghost minister, not a preacher. Paul knows she couldn't preach. She couldn't teach. But she could heal the sick, cast out devils. And she didn't have to make a big wake to do it either. She was slick. Hallelujah. She was an Anglo-Saxon farm girl who never had any education. <laughs> Gather out the stones. We may find ourselves putting stones, throwing the stones in the way. Well, that's the devil's job. He's the hinderer. It's the ministry of Christ to get the stones out of the way. I'm going to look at chapter 6 of the Gospel of John just a little bit, not in a highly structured way. Can you hear me all right? It's a shameful feeling being here in the pulpit. I just came to shout and rejoice in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Gorim, Arate, Otan, Harisai, Shondas, Roketai, Bozinda, Cheno. The voice of the Lord is sounding this very hour, rebuking the carnal leadership that would seize the reins of the church. Yea, God will come into his chariot, and he will crowd man out, and he will take over, and he will drive this chariot to the finish line successfully, victoriously. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. to Jesus. Hallelujah. Chapter 6 of John's Gospel. Do you like to read about Jesus? Hallelujah. You know what I like to do when I get fed up? And you never looked at anybody in your life who gets fed up as often as I do. I get fed up every day, several times a day. Some days I'm fed up all day. When I get fed up, I like to open the gospel and read about Jesus. Does that witness to your heart? Some of you are too religious to admit you get fed up. You think that part of being religious is to conceal those things. Well, it's good not to lay heavy things on people all the time. Be decent. If you fast, put, put uh, Jesus says if you fast, take a bath and bubble bath and douse yourself with Baal de Versailles at $100 an ounce. <laughs> That's, I'm, 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 I'm interpreting up to the 20th century. Didn't he say it? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I got a word from Jethro Vincent through some other brother. He said, turn your weak side toward God and your strong side toward men. Amen. But there's a time for true testimony to reveal how broken, how nothing you are. Apostle, the Apostle Paul did it. And so you see, in God, there's no one set way. Sometimes we should behave this way and sometimes the opposite. With some people, we need to get every burden off of them we can because they're being crushed right now. And you don't forget this fact that I am not trying to throw a burden out on you. I want you to be free. I want to deliver you from even the burdens you think aren't burdens, things you think you ought to carry. 
I know Jesus' burden. It's defined in the Gospels. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. You can run with Jesus' burden. Hallelujah. God did not call to me to slog through mud like an Indian elephant carrying teak logs. But God called me to skip upon the high places of Jacob. Hallelujah. It is the principalities of the air. It is their great delight to hold us down in the dim, foggy valleys of the Christian life. And not allow us to ascend to the sunlit heights of Revelation where the face of Jesus beams upon you as clear as the south star, hallelujah, as variegated as the northern lights, hallelujah, until this master creator of men says, I'm coming to live in your heart and I'm going to speak words out of your mouth that you never imagined or ever conceived in your highest stretches of vision, hallelujah, I have come not to bestow upon you a puny gift of prophecy that works sometime, but I have come to go down to the roots of your being and to make you a prophetic people. Hallelujah. Make you a prophetic people whose mouth speaks the words of unutterable divine wisdom that wise men never encompass in their little temporal basket of ideas. Hallelujah. But he has come to give us all things. Hallelujah. And those all things include the things that I has never seen in here, has never heard, the things that never entered into the heart of man, even in his dreams to the night. But Jesus Christ has come. Amen. 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 Hallelujah! 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 so often and this day those desires shall touch and there shall be that firm clasp by the grace of God and into your heart shall flow those things and those things alone which can satisfy you hallelujah 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 hallelujah, hallelujah. glory to God Glory 
to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. Have thine own way, Lord. Every course in thy highway. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. I've heard quite a few of you speaking in prophetic tongues and you didn't know what it was. Nobody else did apparently and didn't come to birth. I perhaps should help you more. For we learn to identify that prophetic line. And I want to encourage Brother Tony, the words you spoke to me Sunday were very accurate. Exactly what God's been dealing with me for about five years or so. For your encouragement. You see, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be confirmed. When the brother functions in prophecy, I can either confirm him or keep my mouth shut or rebuke him or let it all drift off. I hate this drifting. Oh, I hate this drifting. I can't stand to drift. I like to feel the gospel plow digging and turning over a furrow, drifting off, drifting off. We've got to dig in. That was the whole genius of Mrs. Woodruff Etter and Jack Coe and some of them. They could know how to dig in. They could get a grip on kingdom things. They had sticky hands. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Many things take place in the spiritual realm that the charismatic movement is not aware of, the Pentecostal people are not aware of. The warfare, the warfare we wage has to be defined. We have to not only be able to name the enemy's people and their grades and their offices. You know, in some peculiar way, to be able to name a demonic force disarms it. To be able to name a demonic power or a, a principality disarms it. See, that's why many are befuddled. They're not capable of wrestling, so they feel vague feelings of a great evil, like a great dark shadow crossing over their lives. And they know they've had a brush with some monstrous evil, but God protects them in His grace. They're little children. They don't know what it was. Nameless fear, a vague evil. But as you climb the mountain, as you go up through the dimensions, the day will come when you'll have to grapple with that thing Hallelujah. successfully. And I think one thing that a demonic power does is make you want to quit. For all you have to do to be defeated is just to quit right where you are. It doesn't matter if you're on the first degree or the 33rd degree. If the devil can make you quit right where you are, that's defeat. Amen. I'll get you scared. When I sat back there this morning, I went into an intense confrontation with, a, with a, a satanic emissary. Just like that. Until the pressure was, was intense and the heat built up. And I had to make a decision with my will. That I would not come up to the pulpit because I felt so good, but I would come as an act of the will. And that's how I came into this pulpit. Hallelujah. Not feeling pleasant at all. But this, the, the attitude, the psychology of the battlefield was in my heart this morning as I came up here. Telling that as testimony it may help you. That when you feel your worst, in such a way you couldn't even describe how bad you feel. Yes, bad, not badly. <laughs> Might as well learn a little fast. <laughs> Along the way, praise God. Jesus will teach you something. Hallelujah. I want to tell you a little secret. A true spiritual renewal will bring intellectual renewal. Amen. How many like to throw out the old worn furniture of your mind Hallelujah. with the spring sticking out and the stuffing falling on the floor <laughs> and the moth-eaten old oriental rug that your great-grandmother laid down in Methodist days? How many like to clean house? Yeah. Hallelujah! I'm 
going to do you an eternal favor right now. I'm going to identify the greatest of all house cleaners. His name is the Holy Ghost. You think house mothers can be severe, and you think Sylvia can get up in the air. You wait till you meet the Holy Ghost. And he gets in your old closets, in that old Fibber McGee's closet of old, worn-out religious cliches and old, worn-out religious machinery. You wait till the Holy Ghost opens that closet door and that stuff begins to tumble out. Hallelujah. And he comes not with a broom and a mop and a dustpan, but a flamethrower. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. And nothing will escape the flame of his instrument, not even the least cockroach or silverfish back in the cracks. Everything will go. You will be purged. Be purged. Amen. I'm thinking of this morning on the terms of being made, becoming a vessel. And Paul says, prerequisite to becoming a vessel of honor is that you purge yourself. What does that mean? That the Holy Ghost speaks to you and you say, yes, I will. His flame won't touch a thing until the will gate opens. That impenetrable barrier. You know, lead stops gamma rays, but not God. Distance kills the effect of some light rays. They don't reach us. But it's the human will that's the effective barrier against God and his power. Right. Till we say, I will yes. do your will. Amen. Jesus said, I can of mine own self do no thing. As I hear, I judge. We walk by our ears. We advance by our ears. Judgment by judgment. Hearing it and speaking it faithfully. High fidelity Christians. Reproducing God's voice as near to perfection as possible. And my judgment is just. Because I seek not mine own will. But the will of the Father which hath sent me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Doesn't Jesus speak sweetly? Here we are like babies yet. Now, it's mine. Get out of here. You bother me. You know what the Lord spoke to me this morning? And I say that cautiously. The Lord spoke. Here we are stuck with our wives, our husbands, our roommates. Our president and those teachers. <laughs> it won't be long. <laughs> you will be leaving here. It won't be long. We'll be going home. And they're coming with you. We only have to endure them for a gnat's life. Just a brief evening. Just a brief evening. You know, to the, to the fly fisherman, that most refined of all athletes, <laughs> you call him one. A night in June, in Delaware, what a gap, and the mayflies are hatching so fast, the road is so slick you can't, you can hardly drive. That's a glory. In the evening about nine, to be cast in a fly on the water and having a brown trout that big coming up. There's a glory there, but it just lasts for an evening. And those mayflies just live for a day about. We've only got 70 little years to put up with each other. Why don't we fill them up with love and consideration and see that other man's disabilities and his crippledness and 
how life has bent him out of shape and lay a hand of creative love on him and say, brother and sister, I wish you could be whole in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Oh, we're so unlike the Lord. He never gets fed up with us and we get out of bed in the morning fed up. We have to have that grace, the grace coming. If you think perfect marriages are made in Hollywood, you can burn all the celluloid they've made. If you want to know whether your marriage is made in heaven or not, if you're married, it was. Hallelujah. It's up to us to, up to, us to make it. The Bible says make his praise glorious. <laughs> make your marriage wonderful. That's something I saw today. Just here for a short time. Let's learn to do it in grace, the positive spirit. Hallelujah. Let me read a few more words here as the Lord would lead. Glory to God. Glory to God. Verse 5 of chapter 6 of John. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he said, He saith unto Philip, when shall we buy bread that these may eat? We thought coming to Jesus answered every question. And Jesus himself asks the question. And Philip doesn't know what to say. So he just blurts something out. A human estimation, a judgment. Not after hearing the Father, but just out of his own heart. This Jesus said to prove Philip, for Jesus himself knew what he would do. Hallelujah. See, that's why I can come to the pulpit ignorantly. For Jesus is with me. Lo, I am with you all the days. The rainy days. The days when storm clouds get piled up high. And when lightning strikes at your doorstep. And your loved one dies. Something much more profound than the things that shake us at Pinecrest. And when you're a minister and have to produce, you've gone to a far city, and you're weak and sickly, and the trip has worn you out, and there's nothing. Jesus says, Lo, I'm with you all the days, even that kind of day too. Even unto the consummation of the age. Hallelujah. See, Jesus knew what he would do this morning. <laughs> I didn't have a glimmer. Praise the name of the Lord. Jesus will never ask you a question he can't answer. Philip answered, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. See, man's vision embraces a little for you. He begins with much, with big ideas, and he wind up with a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? Jesus starts with a little and multiplies it. I'm a little man with a little mind, with a little pinched soul, with a little bit of love. My only salvation is to fall into the hands of Jesus. In this little passage of scripture, we see the kingdom as a creative dimension that overshadows you. Jesus walked in the shadow of divine creativity. And everywhere he went, lives were changed, weren't they? And so Jesus fed them miraculously. But I want to skip over and not preach on aspects I ever have before. I don't want to get tangled up in the verses like dewberry vines. I want to drop right down to verse 14. After they had eaten, then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. There was a response by seeing miracles. But it was not a proper response because they tried to take Jesus by force and make him king, and he eluded them. 
This is why God must shake things so frequently. For we start building a structure, we may call it a Pentecostal. The Pentecostal structure definitely has to be subjected to a thorough shaking. So that the Pentecostal mold is not upon us. I heard Sister Beale speak some devastating words in the eight years that I went to Bethesda. I hate to have been a Bethesdan or a true Latter Rain person. I was a nobody, a nothing, and an outsider just looking on and learning something. She looked out over that great audience one Sunday morning and said, you people still bear the Pentecostal image. That hit hard. It was God's purpose to break that image. And over some of us, I believe it has been broken. I want to deal with this idea today. Now look at these Jews. You see, though it is true that the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, these Jews, when Jesus actually came, seemed peculiarly unfitted to receive him as he really was. Now this, this group saw a miracle and tried to seize him and make a king. And then over here in verse 26, Jesus speaks to another crowd. Someone told me again the other day, I don't know who it was, the crowd will destroy you if you're not careful. You can take a bunch of Christians, get them in a crowd, and the crowd will behave in a very unchristian manner. I'll give you a little illustration. Back in the days when Catherine Coleman's gift was mighty and flowed in an indescribable manner, I went down to Pittsburgh a few times after my mother had been there and got healed to the Carnegie Hall, Carnegie Library, hmm. auditorium, yes. There were a bunch of doors along the street and steps went up to them. And, and uh, in the morning, between around 9 o'clock, a big crowd would start to gather, and they'd all be there by the doors. And then they'd suddenly open the doors at 11 in a dramatic manner, and the crowd would trample each other, rushing in to grab the front seats, and they would trample each other. Now, that ought not to be on it, trampling one another to be the one to get healed though the woman did have to elbow through the crowd, but she was the feeble one. <clears throat> Verse 26, Jesus answered him and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Sometimes our motives in, as Jesus' disciples, or the crowd that follows them, our motives can fall to a very crass level we might find ourselves following Jesus for the offerings we get, or the fame, or the power with men that's political, something like that. So Jesus said, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Then said they unto them, What shall we do? that we might work the works of God. I can hear that question coming out of your hearts today. It's a question that's very germane to you and your position and your time in this place. What shall we do that we might work the works of God? I know that's a question that's being asked. It's a real, present, concrete, present question. Is it or not? Is it, is it or isn't it? It is. I know when I'm near the truth. And if you wouldn't say amen or yes, I still wouldn't change my mind. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's something you have to come to. If you cannot receive and hold the word of the Lord, then how in the world can you ever speak the word of the Lord? For you'll think you've got a word at home in your prayer closet. You'll come to the meeting. Things may seem different. Don't ever forget the song leader can miss it. They didn't miss it today, but the song leader can miss it. The song service can veer off. Someone may come up and throw a, a curve, you know, and you may, you'll say, well, I guess I didn't have the word of the Lord after all. And so then you hastily choose another text, you get up and fall all over yourself, fall on your own sword. See, so you have to be able to receive and hold the word of the Lord. The best preachers I know have difficulty holding the word of the Lord. Brother Valor and I explored this together. Brother Sexton, is it hard sometimes to hold the word of the Lord? Hallelujah. He's preached to more people than any other man I know, probably. It's hard to hold the word of the Lord. 
Hallelujah. Today I'm holding the word of the Lord by the grace of God. Not by accumulated mastery. No, by the grace of God. I just go through meetings screaming for grace inside. Grace, grace, oh, give me grace, oh, God. Either grace to endure or grace to function or grace to bring a thing to its perfect end. Or, you know how the Jew says, we have travailed and only brought forth wind. That's tragic. For they were a people who had received the word of the Lord. There should have been a kingdom product come forth in them. But the prophet says, we brought forth wind, a lot of hot air. We just chattered. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Pasina. Takrusu. Ton rashim aingat se. Forushain sasuma. Poshe rakushin. Oh, hold us, O oh God. Hold us in thy perfect purpose. Hold us in the middle of thy road. Hold us on the tracks. That there be no derailment. And send angels to every switch point in our future. That there shall not be a demonic spy there to throw the switch and turn us on to some other track. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 If I could do anything for you, I would make you all read the Word of God and soaked with it and teach you how to discern spirit. If I could do anything for you. What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Now I want you to see here a Jewish vessel, highly defined. Peculiarly wrought, having specifically the Jewish flavor, Judaism. They're a vessel of a given shape and capacity. And let me suggest to you that the principle that I see by the Holy Ghost now is that the shape of the vessel was wrong and the capacity was too little. Does that seem historically right? The shape of the vessel was wrong, and its capacity was inadequate. And I believe what Jesus was saying is, you have to be broken and remade. You have to be reduced to find powder, reconstituted and recast. You have to come under the influence of my hands in a much more yielded, intimate way than you have, so that I can change you. For your thoughts are not God's thoughts. That may have been all right for Isaiah's day in the Old Covenant for an Adamic man brought into a religious imposition of law. Where it was the norm to say, well, man, your thoughts aren't God's thoughts and your ways and his ways are very different. But under New Covenant order, it must be, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we have the mind of Christ. There is no room for a cop-out. No room for a cop-out. No room for a cop-out. Jesus answered his son unto them. Well, let me, before I read that, let me just go back to uh, Yirmiyahu. This agonized prophet Jeremiah in chapter 18 I shunned Jeremiah when I was young. <laughs> I'm not exactly old, but I'm older. I shunned him because he was too heavy. And again, I'm not impressing upon you to become a Jeremiah and cry all the time. But Jeremiah carried a burden of the Lord, and he carried it all the time. And I'm beginning to respect Jeremiah as perhaps being the finest character in the Old Testament. Because he loved the Lord. He loved the Lord's people. He loved the Lord's house. But he loved the word of the Lord so much that he would speak a word that would devastate the temple. Could we do that? And love the Lord and his word so much he would speak a word that would shake the local assembly? That's too much love to expect at first. But it may develop in us. 
chapter 18 of Jeremiah. You notice how well he knows the word, not speaking in vague generalities, but in painful specifics. Brother Valori's mentor used to be fond of saying, we like to hide from God in a thicket of generalities. And God came in the garden, Adam had hid himself in the foliage, and God came and says, Adam, you are somewhere. That's what most people, they're somewhere. They don't know where, but they're somewhere. John knew exactly where he was. He says, I became in the spirit on the Lord's day. You want to know my address? In the spirit on the Lord's day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. You want to know God's address? That pastor in Korea, the pastor at church of 80,000, says, what's your address, Lord? All these heathen deities have a local shrine with an address. God says, my address is the Holy Ghost and the believer. Hallelujah. God lives in you. I said, God lives in you. The God that this book is about lives in you. Hallelujah. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise, I like that, because I'm usually down, and it's so appropriate to me. Get up! Not sitting in quiet, restful repose, but flattened by the steamroller of the time we live in. These times and the clash of spirits have been overwhelming to me, and I have been steamrolled many, many, many times. But each and every time the word of the Lord has come unto me saying, Arise! And the very reception of the word brings the power to obey it. And I say, yes, Lord, and I get up. I trust by grace that it will never come a day when I will not get up again. Arise. I'm like Jeremiah. I'm so far down, I have to arise to go down. He says, arise and go down. Hallelujah! Glory to God. Oh, that can't be God. That must be the devil because he's the king of the underworld. It would be God who says, arise and come up. Like he said to John. He says, arise and go down. Down to the potter's house. God comes down into the mud of the human predicament. But bless God, it's so fitting because he's a potter. Glory. Potters belong in the mud. Hallelujah. For the more mud there's around, the happier the potter is because there's lots of work to do. I believe my God loves to work. Paul said, it's God that worketh in you the will to do his good pleasure. <laughs> the will of God is pleasant. Go down to the potter's house. Yes, he's got a house where he's making the vessels. And there I will cause you to hear my words. I found this out. You cannot hear a specific word until you stand on a specific ground. I could not hear the word I'm speaking to you until I stood right here this morning. It's been that way with me many, many, many times. Well, brother, why couldn't you hear up at your house? It wasn't needed up there. You weren't there. This atmosphere wasn't there. Go to preach to some build-up convention, you know, and they put my picture out and advertise, and, and there's a whole bunch of people coming from several states, don't know what I'm going to say to them. Can't hear the word till I stand on their ground. And when I stand on their ground, my viewpoint will be so different, and my ears will be open, I'll be receptive to hear the appropriate word. Young people, you feel empty? You don't feel half as empty as I felt last night at midnight. What do you do? Edify myself praying in the Holy Ghost. Build myself up in the faith. Minister to my spirit. Hallelujah. How does a spiritual giant get to be a spiritual? Well, he edified himself there. God doesn't sow spiritual giants. He sows seeds. And every seed, as many as received him to them, gave he the power, the authority, the right, the privilege to become the sons of God. How do they become? By edifying themselves to that point. 
eating his word, eating his flesh, drinking his blood, imbibing his spirit, soaking up the heaven, heavenly atmosphere. For a heavenly atmosphere will constitute a people heavenly. So then I went down to the potter's house. Behold, he wrought a work on the wheels, and a vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again. I have just read you my biography in a nutshell. I have been made and marred and made and marred and made and marred. And I was profoundly marred this past year, broken completely out of my <clears throat> former shape. But I have the confidence that the potter is making me into a grander shape and design than I ever knew before. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. That's resurrection to be made again. Brutal religion is to be made once and say, okay, Lord, that's it. <laughs> thus I am and thus I shall ever be. But the first time God makes you just as simple as it were earthen bowl with no handle, no design, just a crude piece of pottery such as a beginner makes, not demonstrating his ineptitude, but your short term in the spirit. Hallelujah. I have some authority to say what I'm saying. When I stood in 1958 after I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I was making in a profound way a new beginning. I had been broken and reformed. One of the greatest prophets on earth stood before me and said, you're starting all over again, aren't you? And I said, yes. And I thought that night that I was making my last, my final beginning. And the race would run straight to the finish line from that point. It wasn't many months, I don't know how many months later, I got broke again. And I started all over again. And I have no way of telling you how many beginnings I have made. But 1979 is a new beginning for me. Right at the turn of the year, I got smashed. I don't know if I was sitting on the shelf and the God whose great pleasure is to shake all things came and shook and I just tumbled off from the vibrations. Or if it came and took me and went this way, I don't know. All I know is I got broke. I got marred. It would be tragic had I got marred when the potter's hands were on the other side of the universe working with something else, but the potter was nearby. It's safe to get broken when the potter is nearby. Hallelujah. My preaching may be quite mysterious and offensive to some, but I'm preaching experience. And I believe the word supports it. Hallelujah. Israel, Jesus said, you Jews, this is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. The foundational level, trusting Jesus for everything. I keep going up the ladder of revelation. Oh, I've been up a lot of ladders. I explored Pentecostalism, I explored fundamentalism, I explored evangelicalism, I explored healing movements. Up the ladder, rain ladder, up the deliverance ladder, up the sonship. Got up on a high rung. God broke me for ten straight years. Ten straight years. And I tell you, I came out of Detroit in a different shape than I went in. And I hurt for those ten years, but I thank God for it. I'm testifying, for the potter's hands were never far off. Could you dare to come to a new Genesis this morning? Say, God, I'm a candidate, because I see something glorious over there. Jesus Christ endured the, endured the cross, despising the shame because of the glory that was set before him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 
I find my salvation not in the most sophisticated word, which no doubt some of the sons have and some of the great Reformed theologians have. Watchman Nee has a very clever system in his writings, but I find the word for me is the word with life in it. It always takes me right back to the cross because that's where the life falls, it's from the wounds of Jesus, where his sacred heart pumps out that last drop of blood for you and me. And the one perfect man who ever existed expires upon the cross and is brought to a total end. The beautiful vessel that puts the classic Grecian urn to shame was marred. But in hopes that many would rise out of the muck of the earth to sit with him upon the shelves of God's eternal house. Oh, God needs many vessels. For Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions, and every mansion must be furnished. Hallelujah. If you think that all the good places in the kingdom are taken, you think again, I've done been there, and God told me differently. You say, well, John took that close place. No, man, no other man can ever put his head on Jesus. I want to tell you, Mrs. Enter saw him in a vision on the cross and walked right up to him and put her hand on his mangled body. John didn't do that. Mary didn't do that. She put his hand, her hand on him. Jesus Christ is available. Amen. He's close to you. Amen. Martin Luther said he's closer to you are than you are yourself. He's underneath your crooked, slick, clever, scheming little psyche. He's underneath it. And he'll illuminate it from behind like a slide. And you'll see the details of your life with crystal clarity. As God's searchlight projects not down onto you, but out through you. How many times when you cut your brother or sister, it turned into a self-revelation, and you say, so that's what I'm like. I hate myself. There's only one further logical step. I repent in dust and ashes. <coughs> Hallelujah. Glory to the name of Jesus. I believe I hear principally today the cry coming out of your beings, make me, make me. Jesus came and called and says, follow me, I will make you. I believe that's a classic call that applies not just to Peter and Andrew and the others, but to everyone that should come, follow me and I will make you. The prodigal son had it made. The prodigal son was a self-made man. The man who has it made never cries, make me. But in a far country through sin, and sometimes sin becomes your handmaiden and brings you to yourself. And he suddenly realized this was all wrong. That he had not gone up in the world, he'd gone down. And he says, I'll go back to my father's house. His servants are better off than I am. And I'll say, Father, make me. When he, on his way out, he says, Father, give me. And on his way back, he said, Father, make me. <laughs> Hallelujah. I see myself as a blob of clay. The virtue of the latter rain is to fall upon me and make me pliable. That's the whole virtue of the rain. Yes. I notice Brother Erskine Holt has one great virtue. He's extremely flexible. He's ready for God to move him on. See, most of Erskine's friends and mine that are his age, they're back in the latter rain graveyard picking out a good spot. We want to go on. We want to see the green valley near the side of the mountain. We want to see the pot of gold at the rainbow's end. I want to see how this thing's going to issue. Hallelujah. I know God's going to win it all. God's going to take it all. He's going to make every nation his part of his kingdom. There's a great battle being waged in this my day. And I want to sally forth on God's battleground like David. You know, it says, when David slew Goliath, it says there was no sword in David's hand. Hallelujah. It says there was no sword in David's hand. But it tells us here of a picture of Jesus in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> Chapter 19 and verse 11. 
John speaking, and I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, a vehicle for Christ. Will you be one of his horses? Will you be a vehicle? And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. John and Paul believe the same thing Paul said in 1 Corinthians, but God is faithful. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. The righteous warrior is the invincible warrior. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The eternal Father, the eternal Word, and the eternal Spirit. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, and white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. Hallelujah. <coughs> yes, when David slew Goliath, he said there was no sword in David's hand. Hallelujah. He only had to get Goliath's sword to do the butchery after he was killed. But those forerunners, that avant-garde of God, the Davids, they are so integrated in their ministry that the sword is in their mouth. Let us be careful with our tongues, for there's a sword. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Hallelujah. Glory to the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. The Lord is telling me to shut up. Hallelujah. Could we all get to our feet in His presence? His holy presence. Could we possibly sing that chorus, I see crowns when I see Jesus? Being settled in the earth. Amen. Amen to the divine order that he would bring us into today. Yes. Amen yes. to his kingdom. Amen. That I voted no condiments to Satan and all of his. Amen. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Glory Amen. to God. Amen. Glory to God. For surely the Lord shall do a new work in the earth, and he shall bring forth the people he hath purposed it. And thou hast heard his call this day, and thou hast heard the word. Consider and know that the Lord hath purposed to call forth the people. And this day thou hast opportunity and privilege and thou hast felt by anointing, thou hast felt the pull of my heart. For I am here, saith the Lord, and I desire to perfect and bring forth a people for my purposes, a people that shall fully give themselves to me. 
Hast thou considered the cost? And art thou willing to pay that price for me? Saith the Lord, yea, I paid all, I gave all. Wilt thou give of thy life, of thy hopes, of thy ambitions, wilt thou give, wilt thou consider what thou hast heard? And wilt thou enter my school, saith the Lord, and wilt thou be prepared of my hand and go through that which it shall cost thee to be a vessel, an instrument for this hour and this day? Consider and then speak to me, for I am waiting to hear thy answer. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, indeed, thou hast brought forth pine crest. <coughs> Lord, it was not of man's choosing that this place would come into existence. It was not of man's ability, capacity. Lord, this place is here because you chose, and you brought forth, and you sustained. Lord, thou knowest, and we confess that we would have utterly failed many, many times, but you kept us and lifted us up. And Lord, we're here that we may fully enter into your highest and your best. Amen. And Lord, again, we ask that we may ascend above that which is common, that which is popular. Lord, that we may ascend above that which is soulish and of earthly, that we may come to that heavenly realm. Amen. And Lord, we ask again and we give thee permission and blessing. Lord, even as you came into the temple and you overturned the tables Lord you sent the money changers out Lord that that that's within us of popularity of commercialism of a soulish realm of seeking popularity in any way Lord oh we ask Lord that you'll drive that out of your church hallelujah you'll drive it out Lord and oh, that you'll perfect a people, Lord, in this hour and this day. Lord, a people in this place, not because we're anything, but Lord, because we're nothing. Lord, we're a challenge to you, to your creativity. Even, Lord, as the earth was without form and void, and you brought about a beautiful garden of Eden. Even so, Lord, this earth that's here, that's without form, that's void, Lord, that you could accept this challenge and speak the creative word into the depth of our being and bring forth, as it were, a garden of Eden, of life, of ministry, of expression, that which will glorify thee, the Lord Jesus Christ. He and he alone is the garden. Oh, we thank you, Lord, that which we desire. Lord, we're asking this morning for that working in each of our lives that we will be equipped and perfected for your purposes. And Lord, that all else will be burned away and left. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, that we may truly learn to walk in the Spirit and follow after thee, that we may be a people of the Spirit. Lord, as the time approaches that we'll be scattered, that we may not revert back to that which we were. It's so easy, Lord, to revert, to fall into a rut, into a pattern of the past. But, Lord, that we shall set our faces as a flint, and we shall, Lord, maintain our lives in Thee. We thank You, Lord, and we give You the glory. And now, Lord, through the morning and the time that we have, and the days to come, that this may indeed, Lord, be a special week of your anointing, your blessing, your Shekinah, your workings in our lives. Lord, a time of preparation for that which is ahead. We thank you, Lord, and we give you the glory. And Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah.